This morning, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Psalms. And we're going to be reading from <clears throat> the second Psalm. Now, I don't know about you. I'm just going to read the first, the first verse of the second Psalm, and then we'll go from there. This, this Psalm is, is a messianic Psalm. It's a Psalm that looks forward to the coming of Christ. Uh, and it says this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, I don't know about you, but there's some things that, that upset me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, how many, you've probably seen this commercial. Now, God has, uh, a few months ago, Sister Kathy Shelton, she had a book on worship in the dance, and she let me read it. And it talked about, you know, a lot of churches, they don't believe dancing is appropriate. But in the, in the Bible, it says worship him with the, with the timbrel and with the dance. So we love to worship with the dance. And when, although I'm not much, I'm not a dancer, but we love to have worship with the dance. But the thing is, in that book, the, the lady who was making the, the, uh, the argument for dancing is worship. She said, do you notice how many times when you watch TV, how many commercials have people dancing to sell cars, to sell, uh, you know, to sell. There's, not, not, there's one on now, you know, we buy any car. Anybody see that one where they do all that, <laughs> you know, and they dance. And how many times do you see, and, and when, after I read that book, that like, that like stuck something in my mind. So every time I watch TV and I see a commercial and people are dancing, I say, they're dancing. And why shouldn't we dance for the Lord? They're dancing for like, you know, for uh, Dove soap or something. I mean, and, and there's one that is particularly annoying to me, okay? The commercial comes on, and, they, and you start playing the Hallelujah Chorus, which is God's word set to music, if you've ever uh, listened to Handel's Messiah. The whole thing, he took Scripture and set it to music. And we all know the Hallelujah Chorus, Hallelujah. You know, the kingdom of our God has become, the, or the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God, and so forth. And that's in the Hallelujah Chorus, and I love that. That's, it's a wonderful, rousing thing. But they're playing this thing, and, and they've got these people dancing because they got, a, they got a good tax refund, okay? And they're dancing, and, and I mean goofy dancing, too, you know, not just like... And I'm thinking, what an insult. That, well, it's to our Lord that in the background... They're praying hallelujah, which people don't understand what that means. That means praise the Lord. And it's almost like they're making a mockery out of worship. Okay? The heathen are raging. Okay? That's, that's, really, that, that's really what it boils down to. Now, I'm sure all of you, and we could, we could go through a lot of different uh, examples, but I'm sure all of us, if you've, if you've read the paper in the last couple days, some group from Wisconsin, okay, they determined, or some, somebody was offended, down in, in, in front of Valley High School, there's, a, there's a, uh, a granite stone with the Ten Commandments on it, okay? And I always, you know, I, I seen that, I've seen that there. I thought to myself, man, I just wonder if somebody hasn't said something about that. Well, sure enough, somebody got offended because it says, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt, I am the Lord thy God. Well, so this group from... Wisconsin, they've determined that it's their duty to come all the way here to New Kensington and Arnold, which they probably never heard of it until, you know, and they're going to straighten this out because they said it's an egregious uh, affront to the separation of church and state. So they're getting ready to get lawyers and everything and, and see, and, and to me, now before I was saved, I don't want to know anything about Jesus. I didn't, I didn't care about Christ. But I would never have thought to travel 2,000 miles to get somebody to take the Ten Commandments off. You, you understand, I figured those Christians are just goofy. You know, I just I don't want to have nothing to do with it. But these people are, they're militant. And the reason is, when you think about it, you know, why do we, as Christians, we'll send people to Africa with the gospel, We'll send people to overseas, you know, different places. Well, they're just preaching their gospel. 
Although their gospel isn't a gospel because gospel means good news, and what they have to preach isn't good news. They're, they're, the, they're the ministers of Satan. Now, they, now, if you would say that to one of them, they'd laugh at you and they'd say, we don't believe, there's no devil. There's no Satan. They don't believe in the supernatural. That's why they reject that. Everything to them, uh, atheists, to them, it's like a natural action and reaction. They're materialistic. So they don't, they don't believe in the supernatural realm. So they think anything that even hints at a supernatural existence or uh, a reality is just a fairy tale, folklore, superstition, whatever. So they are actually ministers of Satan. And just like, you know, we want to go out and win others to Christ. We want to go out in our neighborhood and people, these kids walking up and down the street, and we want to go out there and, and, and try to tell them about the Lord, get them saved. Well, they're, they're trying to do the same thing. We're, we're, Jesus told us to do that, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Their God is compelling them to do the same, to go into all the world and deny the gospel, to deny the existence of a God. And that's what they're doing. They're heathen. They're raging. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain or an empty thing. It's been going on for a long, long time. Rebellion is a trademark of Satan. Rebellion is a trademark of Satan. And those that follow Satan will naturally be rebellious. We've talked about this before. We did a big presentation on, you know, the theory of evolution and all these things and how they'll try to, you know, tell you that, that science has proven that, you know, evolution is real. Science has never proven that, not real science. That's just, you know, they just, somebody came up with the idea that there was a big bang and they filled in the blanks. There's no proof. They can't go back 15 million years and test anything. There's no way they can find that out. It's a theory. It's kind of a dumb one, too, to think everything came from nothing by accident. Just... But, that, but see, they'll, they'll, they'll make it a scientific fact. And they, and they will not allow, in our schools, they will not allow teaching or even a hint that maybe there's an intelligent designer. Why? Because that's against the gospel of Satan. That's against his doctrine. That's against his teaching. We're going to come back to Psalm 2 in a minute, but I want you to read something with me. Why, why do the heathen rage? Well, because they follow Satan, and Satan is rebellious. Turn with me to Isaiah, uh, back to the prophet Isaiah. I read a passage. Uh, help if I went in the right direction. Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, it's one of those passages that gives us uh, just a glimpse at what has happened in eternity past. He begins by talking... Uh, by taking up a proverb against the king of Babylon. And he, he goes into a, a dissertation on the, the power behind the king of Babylon. When we talk about Babylon, now we know there's, not a, there's a, a, some remnants called Babylon. There's not a city called, well, I think there is one in Long Island, but it's not the same one. But, uh, you know, the city of Babylon, which is in Iraq, it's just a bunch of ruins. But Babylon is more than a city. Babylon is a, is a mindset. It's a worldview. And we, we are living in Babylon. Okay, I'm sorry, but we are. Okay, but listen to what he says. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. If you, if you want to know what happened, why Satan became Satan. He didn't start out that way. Satan was originally a created being named Lucifer, who was a light bearer. And it says here in verse 12 of chapter 14 of Isaiah, How art thou fallen from where? Heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Satan has already lost his battle. He's a loser. The fact that men have uh, ceded to him their dominion doesn't make him any more powerful than he was back here. When he rebelled against it, let's read a little bit more. For, listen, listen to what Satan said. For you have said in your heart, this is what happened, this is what happened with Lucifer. For you've said in your heart, 
I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Lucifer, who was created to be the chief covering angel, the cherub, he was created to be the worship leader in heaven. And he, was, he wasn't created as a, you know, a, a red, you know, with horns and, a, you know, ugly. He was created beautiful. He was beautiful. When he appeared to Eve in the garden, he wasn't ugly and hideous. He was beautiful. You know, when we think of a snake, a serpent, we think, I don't like snakes. But that wasn't, that wasn't he, was, he was a shining one. The Hebrew word is like a shining one or a burning one. So he was, he was beautiful and mighty. And he had, a, he was, he had like the chief place amongst all the angels but he said to himself hey look at me he says I'll exalt my throne above God I'm the worship leader when I sing they all sing when I raise my, my hands they all raise their hands I'm and and look how beautiful I am everybody I'll, I'm gonna take God's place I'll sit in the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan's agenda was equality with his Creator. Now that in itself, it's, it's illogical. How can I be the same as the one who created me? I can't create anything. Out of nothing, I mean, I can paint pictures. Well, I can't paint, but, you know, you can create, you can make things and make them look good, but we can't just, like, speak and have it come to pass. We don't have that power. And neither did Satan. Yet he allowed himself to be lifted up, to be puffed up, and he actually thought he could sit with God. What was the lie he told Eve? If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, he said, did God really say that you can't eat? Of this tree? And he said, you won't die. Eve said, well, God said if we eat of this tree, we'll die. Satan said, you won't die. Oh, no, no. God lied to you. No, no. If you eat of the tree, you'll be just like him. God knows that you'll be just like him. And if you are, you know, he's afraid of you being that way. So he told you a lie. That's what, say, that's what they're doing today. That's the same thing. It just manifests itself in a different way. That's the doctrine of Lucifer. That's the doctrine of Satan. That God, either there is no God, or he is there, and he's just, he's just a puppet. Or you can be just like him. Man exalts himself, tries to exalt himself to the place of God. And mankind has done some pretty remarkable things. When you think about it, I think about people that flew to the moon. If you think about that, that old moon's circling around out there, and it's not very big, and it's far. And they was able to hit that thing. <laughs> And land on it and come back. Now they want to go to Mars. I, you know. I mean, I, it costs a lot of money. I mean, you think it costs a lot to drive to Pittsburgh, but just imagine flying to, you know, talk about gas prices, right? And you know why they want to do that? I've said this before. You've heard, you know why they want to do that? They're nothing on Mars. They've sent things to Mars with cameras on it. And you know what they found on Mars? Nothing. Rocks and dirt, nothing. No water, no. They were hoping to see some little, maybe some little thing there. But rocks, that's all they've seen on Mars. But see, they want to send a man up there because they figure if they send a man up there, he can dig a little deeper. Because here's what they're looking for. They're looking for life on Mars or the evidence of life on Mars. Why? Because if they do that, then they can say, you see, the Bible's not true. But you know what they'll find if they send a man there? Nothing. Nothing. Just a bunch of rocks and dirt. Red dirt, that's it, okay? L listen to what he said. Back to Isaiah. Verse 15. Yet, he says, you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. When Satan wanted to lift himself up to the sides of the north, God says, no, you're going to be brought down to the sides of the pit of hell. You shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities? This, this Satan, this once, this, this anointed cherub, this anointed worship leader of heaven that told us we could be like God. 
Bible says he's going to be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. That's where he's going to end up. And sad to say, that's where everybody's going to end up that's stupid enough to follow him. God didn't prepare that place for people. But that's where they're going to end up. See, now, go back to Psalm 2, because I, I do want to just back to the second Psalm. And we're just going to read here a little bit in a couple other Psalms. And just so you understand what's happening, because our, our uh, well, personally, myself, when I see something like that, you know, like what's happening with these people that want to uh, uh, take the Ten Commandments off, I get mad. I get like, wow. Well, they mind their own business. It was the same bunch that had, had wanted to take the, uh, the uh, nativity out of Elwood City. They could, I mean, why don't they stay? I mean, don't they have any nativities in Wisconsin they can deal with? What do they have to come here for? You know. So when I hear stuff like that, I get, I get mad. And people will have a tendency to get mad. But we don't got to get mad. You know what we got to do? We got to pray. <laughs> we got to pray. We don't need a demonstration, because that's what people want a demonstration, is carry signs. And see, and here's the thing, and here's my opinion. Probably, unless, and God forgive me, I hate to be negative, but probably, they're probably coming down. Okay? Because it'll go to court, and some judge somewhere will say, no, we can't have that. And somewhere down the line, and, you know, and so they'll probably come down. But here's the thing, we don't got to wring our hands about it. We don't got to be upset about that. You know what? Because that's the way the world goes. Listen to what he says. Back to Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine of anything? Because they hate God and they follow Satan. Okay? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's human government we talked about a few weeks ago. Their whole purpose is to govern without God. The people who are running our country are governing this country, and I've, I think most of them don't really care about God. They're just doing things that seems right to them. The kings of the earth, they, they, they want to shake off the bond. They don't want to bow down to Jesus. They don't want to bow down to a God that's telling them right from wrong. And we've looked at that before uh, when we were talking about all the different times of rebellion. Uh, Nimrod, remember we said he was like the first human hero. He was the first human deliverer. And he ended up trying to build a Tower of Babel. Mankind wants to rule, wants to govern without answering to God. We want to do it our way. I want to do it my way. And the kings of the earth, they, they conspire against the anointed. These people from Wisconsin, these people that want to you know, take the Ten Commandments down, these people that want to you know, take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, they're, they're, just, they're just looking up and say, I want to break away. I don't want, to, I don't want some un invisible God telling me how I ought to live. It says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. All the violence that's going on in the world, especially in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, the, you know, in, in Libya, in Egypt, and now in Syria, and in other nations, these are the heathen raging. Eventually, they'll be raging against God's people, Israel. Okay? What's God's reaction? Is God sitting up there? Walking back and forth saying, oh, what are we going to do about it? They're going to take the Ten Commandments out of Valley High School. No. Here's what, here's what God is doing. He that sits in the ha heavens shall what? Ha, ha. Not, not a happy, you know, good joke laugh, <laughs> but a laughter of derision. Like, who are you? Ha, ha. See, it looks like they win. But the God in heaven, the one who sits on the throne... The one who created Lucifer. The one who created them. The God who sent his son to die for them is laughing at their, at their ideas, trying to break free from God. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them. He's going to laugh first, and then he speaks to them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of that, that bunch. If he doesn't save them, I pray for their salvation. You know what I've seen on, I go on YouTube, okay? There was a guy, and, and I, just, I just saw this little video, so I don't know 
you know, I'm just telling you what I saw. This guy used to play for a band called Korn, K-O-R-N. Anybody ever hear that band? Heavy metal, ugly, I mean, you know, the, and I never listened to him, but I've heard one or two things on YouTube because I wanted to, they had some, they had a thing about this guy. He was the guitar player. They got tattoos. And, they're, and, they, and, they, and that group, they would play songs. They, 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 I mean, they were as anti-Christ as you could get. He got saved. He got saved. They showed him getting baptized. They, they showed him, and they, they, they talked to him. I can't remember his name. It was some kind of strange name. But, but you know, he said he had a daughter, and, and he, you know, he was, God was dealing with him about things. And he got saved. You know what? I pray for these, these folks from this group. I pray for them to get saved because they, they make a lot more noise than folks who have been sitting in church for 50 years. Okay? Now, that's the way it is. You know, folks can sit in church all this time and figure, I'm saved, I got mine, I'm here, I'm there. And, and we, tend, we tend to kind of get comfortable with that. But you get somebody like that, that was, when you look at him, he looks ugly, man, because he got these tattoos. But he got saved. Okay? So I pray for him to get saved. But listen, if, if, they, if, if God doesn't save them, if they don't get saved, they're going to end up in the pit with their God. It says... Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, in verse 5, and vex them in his sore displeasure. God's not happy. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This is one thing we can depend on. It doesn't matter what the government does. It doesn't matter what Freedom From Religion Foundation does. It doesn't matter that Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. He is going to be set as the king in Zion. That's a, that's a done deal. Hallelujah. It's a done deal. It's not if... It's not maybe, it's done. He's the king. He earned it with his blood. He paid for it with his life. The creator is going to sit on the throne of Jerusalem. I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. They don't understand it, but they are, they are serving as to be the inheritance of Christ. When he comes and establishes his kingdom, he's going to own them. And it says that all are going to come and worship him in Jerusalem. When Jesus himself sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and comes and establishes his kingdom, all the nations of the world will come to Jerusalem and worship him. I want to start worshiping him now. I want to do it now before I do see him. I want, I want to bow my knee before I die. Because if I wait till after I die, I'm going to bow my knee and be sent to the lake of fire. I don't want to, I don't want to go there. Now listen what he says. We're going to look at a couple passages this morning and then we're going to close. He says, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Jesus is going to rule the world. And he's not going to have a cabinet, and he's not going to have a, a congress that he's going to have to answer to. He's going to be the ultimate king. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Listen, serve the Lord. Supreme Court, federal judges, uh, local judges, king, uh, president, king, congress, senate, if you're wise, this is what you'll do. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Listen, we need to understand that there is a hell. I was talking to somebody the other day. He was saying, like, well, everybody, God, God died for everybody. Jesus died for everybody. Well, he did if they put their faith in him. There's some folks that want to tell you there's no hell. Jesus said there's a hell. And when we, when we turn our back on him, when we try to follow after uh, the, the, the God of this world, Satan, that's where we're going to end up. That's where we're going to be. Okay, listen. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. I want you to just look at a couple more psalms with me, okay? Turn to Psalm 46. Uh, our brother uh, Harold Malik preached on this a couple weeks ago. Turn to Psalm 46. So when you see this stuff and you hear this stuff, and... Uh, That's okay, sis.
Okay, Michael, let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray you would be with Michael. Lay your hand upon him. Bring healing to his body. You don't know, I don't know what the situation, but you do. Father, be with my sister Katrina and her sister and her family. Give them peace, Father, and we just pray that we're going to have a good result from this whole situation in the name of Jesus. Reach down and touch, Lord, and heal in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, sis. Hallelujah. His name is Michael. Okay, God, okay sis, God bless. We'll be praying. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Remember Michael in your prayers. Remember Michael in your prayers and our sister. Hallelujah. Okay, Psalm 46. Listen to what he says. When you, when you see this stuff happening and when you see all these people seem like they're winning the battle, listen to what he says. God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in time. He's a help right now. He's a help right now. And what's going on with, with, with her family, with her, with her brother in the hospital, God's a help right now. With what you're dealing with right now, God's a help right now. It's not tomorrow. He'll be a help tomorrow. He was a help yesterday, but he's a help right now. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, will we not fear? Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though they take the Ten Commandments down in front of the school, though they take them off the wall, though they take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, though they elect the worst, it doesn't matter. He won't be moved. He's in control. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof. Listen, there's a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Are you drinking from that river this morning? Are you drinking from the word of God this morning? Are you partaking of what what he said he would do? It says, There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Again, this is prophetic. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. How can can you say this morning, I will not be moved. Though the tempest rages. Though the storm rages. I'm not going to be moved. Though they pass laws. I won't be moved. Verse 6, the heathen, what? Raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. See, all the things that are happening in the world, you know what? God got it all marked off. He got it. He's ready. He has it all under control. And when he does begin to move, it's going to, he says, the earth melted. Things will change radically and drastically. The time is coming. The Apostle Peter uh, talked in one of his letters. He said, you know, there's going to come a time when the, when the elements are going to melt. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So God's in control. As bad as things get, God is in control. He says, the Lord of hosts is with us in verse 7. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in sunder. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know. See, this is what, what our sister was saying, the word that came. Be still. We need to, sometimes we need to just sit down and shut up. Amen. See, we talk, you know, if you're like me, I talk to myself. When, when I'm going through something, I talk to myself. When things start going bad, I start, to, I start telling myself all the horrible. If I, if, I don't, if I don't get myself in line with the word, I'll start talking. You ever talk to yourself? And usually the things I say to myself aren't real edifying. But the word tells us to be still. That means be quiet. That means shut up. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Everybody that ever lives will one day know who God is. If, if they don't learn it on this side of the grave, they're going to learn it on the other side. But there's not going to be one soul in heaven or in hell who's going to scratch their head and say, gee, I wonder who God is. He reveals himself to us if we'll just listen. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. One more psalm and we're going to close, okay? Over Psalm 62. Psalm 62. When I first got saved and I started playing, I wanted to play music for the Lord. The first song, one of the first songs I learned 
was from uh, a, a group called Wendy and Mary. I don't know if those of you have been around long enough to know Wendy and Mary. And they, they had a song based on this psalm. And it says this, Truly my soul, what? Waits. What are we hearing this morning? Waiting on God? Being still? Not being afraid of the, of, of, of the noise that Satan is making, the, the sabers that he's rattling? Truly my soul waits upon God. From Him comes what? He's going to save us. He will come and save us. We're His. We're His. He'll come and save us. Even, even if the plight we're in is because of something stupid we've done. That got quiet. Sometimes, sometimes the mess we're in is because of things that we've done that weren't too... You ever get yourself in the jam? Huh? Even then, when we confess that and we say and we repent, he'll even save us then. You know, some of us, we're like, you know, if somebody's got trouble and if they cause it themselves, we'll say, well, man, that's our own problem. They made their own bed. They can lie in it. They can... Thank God he doesn't do that. When I call upon him, he doesn't say to me, well, it's your own fault, you dummy. He'll come and save me. He wants me, to, he wants me to confess. He wants me to repent. It says if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from unrighteousness. I mean, he doesn't just like let us go and make the same mistake over and over again. He wants us to learn some things from that. But I thank God that from him comes my salvation. He only is my rock. I'm not going to stand on the United States of America. I'm not going to stand on the church of God. I'm not going to stand on the doctors and the nurses. He's my rock. All those other things can be shaken and changed. I'm not going to stand on my reputation. I'm not going to stand on my bank account. I don't have much money anyhow. I'm not going to stand on these things. But the only thing that won't be moved, the only thing that doesn't get devalued, is Jesus Christ. He's my rock. He's my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be, I'm not going to be moved. The heathen can rage all they want to, and they ain't going to move me. There's, there's times you get scared. There's times you get a little shaken. But we won't be moved. Why? Because we're strong and mighty? No, because the rock I'm standing on is strong and mighty. He's my rock. He's my defense. He says, How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall you be. As a, a tottering fence. Now, he's, what, what's he doing? He's speaking to the heathen. Yeah. How long are you going to keep up this crusade? How long are you going to keep up your missionary effort for Satan to try to eliminate God from everybody's consciousness? He says, verse 4, They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. It's, it's just what we talked about in, in Psalm 2. Uh, the heathen are raging, trying to pull God from his throne, just what Satan tried to do. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Amen. Mm. My soul, wait. There it is again. Now, waiting. This waiting thing is getting... <laughs> <laughs> wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. I pray for the doctors. We wait for them to call and tell us what they can tell us. I wait for my accountant. I wait for whatever. And you know what? All them people, they they try to do what they can. But ultimately, I want to wait on God. It's hard to wait. It's hard to wait when you're scared. It's hard to wait when when you don't know what the outcome is going to be. I hate waiting. <laughs> we all want that microwave faith, you know. 20 seconds. Answer. Doesn't happen like that. My soul wait thou only upon God for my expectation is from him. Just a few more verses. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. That, that's the, the chorus. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. You people, pour out your heart before him. Oh, listen, 
Have you ever poured your heart out Amen. when nobody's looking and nobody's around and you know God is there? Yes. And you just cry out yes. and you pour your heart out. Sometimes folks pour their heart out so people can see them. You know, oh, we get the we call it drama. OK. <laughs> Nobody hears drama. But <laughs> drama queen and there's a couple of drama kings, too. I know. <laughs> All right. But, you know, when it's just you and God, there's no need for drama. When you pour your heart out in front of God, it's not drama. Sometimes you just got to get on your face and cry out and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen. God, I'm scared. God, I'm afraid. God, I don't know. I'm afraid to take this next step. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. But he says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. I want to ask you this morning, and I know if, if we went around the room and I said, and I asked you, what are you dealing with in your life? This morning, I know every one of us could say, and I know personally because you share with me, but also I just know just general, everybody, everybody's dealing with something. Life is short and full of trouble. That's what Job said. How many people say amen? amen. And I'm sure if I went around and I, I talked to everybody, we'd all put our hand up and say, I got this, I got that, I got this, I got that. But listen, whatever your problem is, we all have one common thing. If you're saved, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we have a rock. We have a rock of our salvation. We have a defense. We have a fortress. We have a king. We have a God who is over all those things. I'm just going to pray this morning. We're going to close in prayer and dismiss. But I want to pray for everybody in here, which is just about everybody that's going through something. It might be something in your body. It might be something financial. Maybe you're waiting to hear from a doctor. You know? Man, I'll tell you, one of those, the ugliest, in my opinion, one of the ugliest words in the English language is biopsy. <laughs> some of you, some of you are waiting and you're scared. We want to pray. Won't you stand with me as we pray? We have a God. Listen, the heathen can rage all they want to. They can scream and yell and roar and file lawsuits. And I have a God that's over all those things. Amen. Father, this morning, I pray, Lord, that as we see these things and read these things in the paper, Father, we, we get upset, we get afraid, we get mad because it seems like the enemy is winning. Father, they go into court and they file these things and they win in the courts. It seems like the enemy is winning. But Father, your word assures us that it might look like he's winning now, but you have already won. The battle is already fought and won. On Calvary, Jesus Christ, you defeated death. You defeated. When you rose from the grave in, in three days, you defeated death. Father, I pray, God, I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid of dying because Jesus defeated death. Father, we will wait upon you. We will praise you and worship you, even in the times of our struggles, even in the times when we're, we're, we're wondering what's going to happen. We'll still lift up our hands and give you glory and honor because you're worthy of glory and honor and power and all these things. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus, you're coming back to reign on this earth. Until you do, you are our rock. You are our salvation. You are our fortress. You are our defense. You are our only hope. Father, I ask you this morning that you would anchor those thoughts in our heart as we prepare to go from this place, but not your presence, that we would leave here with a confidence knowing that you are in control. Father, we do what we can. We do what we have to. But Lord, our faith is in you. Because you promised us you would never leave us or forsake us. You promised us that all power was given, all authority was given unto you. Father, we look to you to be the rock of our salvation. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. We're going to just sing a little song. And as always, if anybody needs prayer, please stick around. And we'll be happy to pray with you after the service. Father, my soul finds rest in God.